an act to reinstate and extend the deadline for commencement of construction of a hydroelectric project involving the American Falls Reservoir. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill? So many as are in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for one minute for the purposes of inquiring on the majority leader the schedule for the week to come. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I now yield to my friend, Mr. McCarthy, the majority leader. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the House will meet at noon for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business. Votes will be postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday and Wednesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and noon for legislative businesses. On Thursday, the House will convene at 9 a.m. and will welcome the President of Ukraine for a joint meeting at 10 a.m. There will be no morning hour, and the House will meet at noon for legislative business. On Friday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. Last votes of the week are expected no later than 3 p.m. Mr. Speaker, the House will consider a few suspensions next week, a complete list of which will be announced by close of business tomorrow. In addition, as I previously announced, the House may consider the President's request and act on the continuing resolution as early as Tuesday. The House will also consider a package of 14 bills designed to encourage an American energy revolution. This common sense energy plan will be comprised of previously House passed bills that received bipartisan support and focus on production, infrastructure, reliability, and efficiency. Finally, Mr. Speaker, members are advised that the House will also consider a package of jobs bills that will include 15 House passed bills. This bipartisan jobs plan fosters an economic recovery and gets America back to work in good paying jobs. And I thank the gentleman and yield back. I thank the gentleman for his information. And before asking him questions about the schedule of the week to come, I want to uh, commend the gentleman. Uh, we had a meeting just a few uh, minutes ago at which we, almost all the members of the House, uh, rose in a moment of silence, Mr. Speaker, to remember those uh, not only who lost their lives on 9-11 uh, 13 years ago, but also those who acted so heroically to save lives. Uh, we certainly uh, remember uh, those uh, brave uh, individuals that knew uh, what was going on and took that plane down in Pennsylvania that we believe was undoubtedly uh, directing towards the dome of the Capitol to decapitate the symbol of the world's greatest democracy. I want to thank the Majority Leader for leading us in that uh, time of silence to remember that uh, horrific event and to say, uh, as he said just a few moments ago, uh, we are still uh, threatened by those who would use terror and barbar barbarism uh, to attack their own people and others around the world. So I thank the gentleman for his leadership on that issue, and uh, I also thank him for his comments about the fact that we came together on 9-11, not as Democrats and Republicans, but as Americans. Uh, we now are at a similar time where uh, there is a great threat uh, posed to us and to others. And the gentleman's uh, suggestion that we would meet that with the same kind of bipartisanship is welcomed uh, on this side of the aisle as well, so I thank the gentleman for that. Now, with respect to the schedule, uh, I, I, well, I yield to the gentleman if he wanted to say something. That's right. Uh, with respect to the schedule, uh, Mr. Leader, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering whether or not, uh, and it may not have been decided yet, whether or not the uh, President's request to which the gentleman referred in his announcement uh, and the CR uh, would be considered together or, or separately. I yield to my friend. Well, I, th I thank the gentleman for yielding. There has been no decisions yet. As you know, the President uh, requested this week, and that's why we postponed and we're continuing to work through. But I will um, notify the gentleman as early as we get a um, 
I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me ask further, uh, and I know that this answer to this question is we'll have to see, but I, I have uh, put our own caucus on notice, Mr. Leader, that we may well need to be here uh, for the week after the uh, break uh, for the holy days. Uh, is that consistent with your thought? I yield to my friend. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Yeah. Uh, currently on the schedule, we are scheduled to be here that last week. There has been no change to that schedule. Um, as I noted just a little earlier, the only change we made coming back this Monday, we want to make sure we have enough time and all the members have enough time to uh, digest and get their questions answered. Um, but currently, that schedule continues to hold. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, with respect to the uh, Appropriations Committee and the CR, uh, it's our expectation that the uh, CR is scheduled to uh, have a date of December 11th, as the, that's, is, uh, I noticed that Senator Cruz has made another suggestion uh, to clarify, is December 11th still the date that the uh, majority is looking for to uh, uh, run the CR through? I thank I yield, the my friend. <laughs> I thank the gentleman for yielding. Yes, as of this time, and we have posted it this, um, this week, December 11th is the duration that the continuing resolution would go through. I yield back. Lastly, I would say, and the Majority Leader and I have had discussions about this, uh, and so he knows our strong conviction on this side of the aisle, that we are still very hopeful that we could have a longer-term uh, extension of a reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank because we believe uh, that that is very important to give some stability and competence to the marketplace, both lenders and borrowers and manufacturers, uh, large, medium, and small. Uh, and I hope the gentleman would continue to consider with his caucus the possibility of having a, a, a longer-term uh, reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank, which, as the gentleman knows, expires on September 30th. I yield to my friend. Well, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and uh, we have had many discussions, and as the gentleman knows, in the last um, reauthorization, it was a shorter time period with many reforms in there. And many feel that those reforms have been ignored. Many feel that um, the bank provides certain things the private sector is doing, knowing that we are on a short time period, also knowing the threat before America today and the time that we want to make sure that we can have this debate and the ex expiration date. We felt that it is best to, in the CR, extend that out to June have that debate later moving forward so you're not disrupting any time debating the threat of, from the terrorists and also doing the work that needs to be done. But I, I do understand the gentleman has talked to me many times about that, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his comments and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it adjourn to meet on Monday, September 15, 2014, when it shall convene at noon for morning hour debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business. Without objection. The gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that it may be in order at any time on Thursday, September 18, 2014, for the Speaker to declare a recess subject to the call of the Chair for the purpose of receiving in joint meeting His Excellency Petra Poroshenko, President of Ukraine. Without objection. The Chair will now entertain requests for one-minute speeches. Purposes, the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank our veterans. This weekend, I will have the great honor to join the 2014 Hometown Heroes Celebration in Wayne Township, which is in Clinton County, Pennsylvania. <laughs> The focus for this year's celebration is honoring those from the Vietnam War. It will also include to pay tribute to our veterans from the Korean War and World War II eras. 
We will honor these local heroes for their service and their brothers in arms, including those who didn't make it home or gave that ultimate sacrifice. Each day, especially on September 11th, we are reminded of the many threats posed to America and its citizens. We're also reminded of just how blessed we are to have such brave men and women who for generations have served our nation and laid their lives on the line in, in protection of our freedoms. Mr. Speaker, we owe those who have served and those who are serving in uniform our unwavering support and thanks, and today I offer my sincere praise for the veterans of Wayne Township and the surrounding areas. You are our hometown heroes, and you deserve as much. And I yield back. Gentleman yields. From Illinois, rise. Without consent, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Today we remember those who lost their lives 13 years ago on a day that changed our nation forever. Yesterday, Congress bestowed the highest civilian honor, the Congressional Gold Medal, on the fallen heroes of 9-11. One of those was Todd Beamer, a high school friend of mine, declaring, let's roll. He and the other brave Americans on Flight 93 helped prevent further catastrophe while sacrificing their own lives in the process. This summer, I had the privilege of touring the Flight 93 National Memorial and Museum in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. There I presented a Wheaton Academy High School yearbook to be included in the museum's archives. Construction is still underway on this moving tribute to the 40 heroes. Looking out over the crash site, I was reminded again that the world is still a dangerous place and our freedoms are only a generation away from extinction. Freedom isn't inherited. It must be protected against those who destroy it. Honoring the sacrifice of Todd and all who perished on 9-11 requires we forever remain vigilant in defense of our nation's cherished values. I yield back. The gentleman yields. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas rise? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I don't believe there is one American that will forget where they were on 9-11, that crisp morning, bright, shining sun. For me, I was here in the United States Capitol, and the unimaginable occurred. We would not have fathomed at one time that the homeland would be attacked. I rise today to acknowledge the brave men and women who gave and risked their lives and those who lost their lives and the families that still mourn. It is particularly potent that we are now in the backdrop of another terrorist act and another president has to rise to defend America. This Congress must also do so. But we must recognize that peace is as well an important value that Americans love. We are peace loving. And we must do it in the name of those who lost their lives. United Airlines 93, American Airlines Flight 77, American Airlines 11, United Airlines 175. And we must recognize that we were unsuspecting. And therefore, I'll pledge to those who still mourn, who've lost their father or mother or husband or wife or child or friend, as we debate these serious times, we will be reminded that there must be no terrorists that terrorizes us and causes us to not do the right thing. So whether we are Republicans or Democrats, I ask us on this day to hold a moment of personal silence, one that will reflect our love for those who are lost, and then to take the words of George W. Bush, president at that time, whether terrorists are brought to justice or, or justice is brought to the terrorists, justice will be done. A firm hand, yes. But as well, we must be reminded of the humanitarian aspect of this and realize that as we stand with the President and the gentlewoman's time has expired, that we honor those who are in mourning. Let's remember 9 11 is a tribute to the Americans who sacrificed their life. I mourn this day. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address in, uh, the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise to pay tribute to the innocent victims who lost their lives on September 11, 2001. 
Thirteen years ago today, our homeland was attacked. Evil man manifested itself in the form of extremists who murdered 3,000 Americans. Our world in America was forever changed by the tragedy that unfolded in New York, Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania. That evil that came out of the shadows in 2001 still exists today, in 2014. If left unchecked, it will continue to grow for the foreseeable future and threaten us once more. Now more than ever, we must remain vigilant in the defense of our great country and against those who wish America harm. We can no longer afford to be divided as a nation into Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals. We must come together today from this point forward as Americans. Today, let us pause and pray in remembrance of those who fell on 9-11 and for all who continue to stand in harm's way at home and abroad. And I yield back. Gentlemen yields. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas rise? Speaker, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent. The gentlewoman will state her request. Mr. Speaker, I was unavoidably detained in a security brief briefing on the issues dealing with the terrorist group ISIL, and I missed uh, the vote uh, on the motion to recommit on uh, H.R. 3522, the Employee Health Care Protection Act. If I had been present, I would have voted aye. I ask that the aye be reflected in the appropriate place in the record uh, on the account of my being unavoidably detained in a security briefing. I ask unanimous consent. Without objection. Thank you. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I would like to yield to my dear friend from Georgia, Mr. Westmoreland, for such time as he may use. I want to thank my friend from Texas for yielding. And, Mr. Speaker, I come before you today to honor one of Georgia's greatest, Mr. S. Truett Cathy. Truett Cathy was known across the globe as a successful businessman, an author, and the inventor of the chicken sandwich. Mr. Cathy would also uh, say that God created the chicken, we created the chicken sandwich. But most importantly, he was a beloved great-grandfather, grandfather, father, and husband. And above all else, his strong Christian faith could be seen in everything he did. It didn't matter if it was his company, his employees, his generosity. It was all embodied in the love and the good news of Jesus Christ. Truett's whole life was about giving hope and opportunity to those who had none. His dedication to helping children who have been abused and lost in the foster system reflected how important family, family values were to him. And are only a fraction of what Truett, a man of such great integrity, was able to accomplish. Having come from nothing himself, he wanted every child to have the same chance at success and happiness as he did. Truett established the Windshape Foundation, which includes 11 long-term foster homes for 95 children. The Windshape Foundation helped not only children in bad circumstances, but for all periods of an individual's life. Truett also used his foundation as an opportunity to show you that faith in God can help you through your journey. By providing opportunities for young adults to reconnect with their faith in the college program, offering retreats for married couples to renew their love for each other and their love for God, creating our next generation's leaders through Christian wilderness camps to learn how to be a better leader and a part of a team. Truett believed building Christian leaders shouldn't be limited to our country's borders and took Windshape International through missionary trips and projects in over 43 countries. His generous work and humble spirit of Truett Cathy has touched more lives than we could ever imagine, and many successful individuals today have him to thank. Even in business, Truett Cathy treated his Chick-fil-A employees like family, 
endowing a scholarship foundation to help send them to college. Chick-fil-A has actually awarded more than $25 million in the last 35 years, done through $1,000 scholarships to 20 or 30 hardworking and deserving employees every year. Through all his work, Truett gave the most important gift of all to many underprivileged children and teens, and that's hope. You can never put a price on having someone believe in you and give you a chance at success by giving you your first job and teaching you the value of respect and hard work and what the ethics of being employed was all about. Truett sums up his life mission and his best work himself. Nearly every moment of every day, we have the opportunity to give something to someone else. Our time, our love, our resources, and I have always found more joy in giving when I did not expect anything in return. Having the opportunity to know Truett and his wonderful family has been a privilege. And I thank him for all he has done for the people of Georgia and across this nation, for the hope and confidence that he's given so many youngs to continue on and to fight for what they believe. Joan and I want to send our condolences and prayers to the Kathy family during this time of great sorrow for us all. And with that, uh, I'll yield back to the gentleman from Texas. Thank you. I do appreciate that tribute to a truly uh, great man. This time, I would like to yield to my friend, Mr. Holtburn, from Illinois, for such time as he may consume. I want to thank my good friend from Texas, Mr. Gomert, for yielding to me. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to highlight the complexities of our nation's health care system on the eve of the first open season since Obamacare was launched. I want to offer a hope to the millions of American consumers who still need real solutions to help ensure that their families can obtain necessary and affordable health care. Today, our health care system in America has two faces. It can provide state-of-the-art care, while at the same time can be one of the most complex and frustrating systems in the world. Americans feel the effects of these complexities every single day. They repeatedly put health care near the top of their list of issues that concern them and they should be concerned. The system today has so many conflicting incentives, rules, and regulations that few Americans have the ability to make sound and affordable decisions for themselves and their families. Obamacare introduced a whole new level of fuzziness to an already opaque system. Families are increasingly worried that they will pay more and more for health insurance that covers less and less and lowers the quality of care. They search for long-term economic security, but find unsustainable costs instead. Even with the advent of the President's health care law, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, many middle-class Americans haven't found their health care to be more affordable, nor have they felt secure with the current system. Americans have a right to feel frustrated with the Affordable Care Act today. It's far from what they were promised. I've heard stories from too many of my constituents who received letters terminating their coverage, like Julia from Gurney, Illinois, or of others facing rising health care costs, like another who told me, I wonder if the administration ever thought about those of us who have to pay for our health care coverage with no extra help and how much more we would be paying, or of the employers who have had to eliminate health benefits or of workers and teachers whose hours have been reduced because employers can't afford the higher premiums, or of families losing access to doctors they've known for decades. Those doctors also face conflicting rules that result in adverse consequences. They want to continue to provide care, but many are no longer accepting Medicare patients and must now require upfront payments for care just to keep their practice open. There aren't enough doctors and specialists to go around in the narrow networks. We have tried to address the long and sometimes life-threatening waits for veterans. Now is the time to address those long lines for everyone else. Surely this is not the health care system we were promised, nor does it paint a bright future for the health status of Americans. That is why on August 28th, I convened the third community leadership forum in Illinois' 14th congressional district. Our topic, health care. Our focus, the consumer. 
I assembled three separate panels to discuss issues ranging from the ACA and how it will continue to affect consumers in 2015 to how technology and innovation can improve health care outcomes to how best to increase consumer access to and quality of health care. It was clear that there was a thirst for the community to come together. In the weeks preceding the forum, I was excited to hear about uh, the panelists' enthusiasm. The forum included CEOs of local and statewide health care organizations and hospitals, CMOs, and executive vice presidents of insurance companies, and most importantly, my constituents. I heard about the issues directly affecting every level of our health care system. Most importantly, our focus remained on offering consumer-oriented solutions. Never before had I been confronted with such passion and desire to offer answers for our national health care system and work together to implement solutions. Today I want to share just a selection of the great ideas that could help American consumers of health care. Many of these will be available in a full report I plan to release on my website, hultgren.house.gov in the coming days. During the first panel, one of the primary challenges healthcare and small business insurance professionals discussed was how to ensure consumer choice and access to the broader market of providers. I heard numerous times about the need to reduce healthcare costs overall by pursuing a market-based system with less regulation. Surprisingly, the only sub-industry in healthcare that is lowering costs and increasing the quality of care is elective procedures, an industry perpetuated by market control. Insurance providers told me the difficulties they face operating within the ACA's demands and slim margins. Certain insurance regulations, like the medical loss ratio, exasperates cost. These costs translate directly into higher premiums for constituents and businesses. Instead of encouraging higher quality of care and lower costs with advancements in technology and economy, we find ourselves moving in the opposite direction. Relieving these ineffective and inefficient mandates could be a first step to opening up more options for insurers and consumers. In the second and third panels, I heard from hospital executives and university innovators about the biggest challenges facing medical technology and innovation. With innovators and leaders in the biotechnology and medical technology industry at the table, I learned about the ever-present and insurmountable valley of death, the period of time between a potentially life-saving device or product discovery and its introduction to the broader market. This period is encumbered by regulation and bureaucracy. In Europe, devices and medicines that show promise are approved and brought to market faster and more effectively. To help with technology transfer and to quicken innovation and its application, I learned about ways to fill the gap between discovery and investment. Legislation like the Transfer Act, introduced by my colleague, Representative Chris Collins from New York, will help reduce the strain caused by the valley of death in the innovation process. Another method is the preservation of the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980. One speaker recommended fully funding the FDA to speed the approval process to bring new devices to market in the United States. The conversation went so far as to talk about the intersection of education policy and scientific research, highlighting the need to make sure our kids receive the best STEM education our schools can provide. These conversations clarified that medical innovations are a vital component to strengthen treatments and reducing the cost in the healthcare system. Throughout the day, it was confirmed again that the current healthcare landscape is rocky and uncertain. But there are many who are willing and eager to work together to tackle these challenges. The House is also eager to work hard to help fix our healthcare system. Numerous times, the House has said yes to fixes and alternatives that address our system's deep challenges. We don't need to wait for our healthcare system to get worse before it gets better. We can work to fix it now. Americans have a right to feel frustrated with the ACA today. It's far from what they were promised, but that should only spur us onward. We are only months from the start of open enrollment, November 15th. The question is, can all of us in Congress, in healthcare, and constituents work together to bring much needed reform to our healthcare system? Can we raise the quality of care our country offers while lowering cost for Americans across the country? I believe we can, and I trust these solutions will help get us there. I want to thank my good friend from Texas, and I yield back the balance of my time to him.
Thank you. There's so much at risk right now in this country. And the president gave us uh, a fine address last night, uh, very interesting. Uh, I know some people say, you know, when in times of trouble, when the United States is threatened, we need to all get together behind our leader. Uh, as someone once said to me about uh, Republicans, he said, I just wish the Republicans would all run the same play together. And I responded, I agree. I, I wholeheartedly want for the Republicans to all run the same play together at the same time. But I said, the trouble is, if my leader calls a play run into the wrong end zone, I'm not blocking for him. And that's also, I think, applicable with the President of the United States. I was blasted uh, after statements on Fox News saying that if the President wanted to go to war with ISIS, I would support that. So I was anticipating something last night that would unite us and not divide us. To relate, one of the problems with the president is, as he starts out early in his speech, saying, as commander-in-chief, my highest priority is the security of the American people. Well, I've come to to know friends, uh, be close friends, with a number of the family members of Ty Woods, Glenn Darty, Sean Smith, Ambassador Chris Stevens, and they debate. They don't believe that the highest priority of this president is the security of the American people. The, the actions of this president in saying that he care so deeply about the security of the American people doesn't seem to resonate when you stand by weeping parents who've had, who've watched their son's head be cut off by these enemies and you say it's your highest priority to protect the American people, but they're wondering, uh, do you spend five or six hours that same day that you spend five or six hours playing golf, do you spend that much time figuring out a way to protect other Foley's? That's a tough sell. And the president said, now let's make two things clear. ISIL is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents. Well, that's certainly got to be a shock to the radical Islamists who brutally kill, behead, maim innocent people in the name of what they say is their religion. And in fact, the American people don't seem to be sold on what the president said. This story from CNN filed at 8.15 a.m. this morning by Ashley Killow um, quotes what the president said about ISIL is not Islamic, no religion condones killing of innocents. Uh, then they have a number of tweets, according to the CNN article, uh, Twitter just lit up with responses to the president saying that, lots of retweets, and, and uh, let's see, from Ron Christie, ISIS isn't Islamic? What kindergartner briefs the president on terrorism? Another Obama, quote, ISIL is not Islamic. He just countermanded anything he plans to say tonight. Right there is the fatal flaw. Another, uh, ISIL is not Islamic. Hello? This ISIL, Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Another, ISIL is not Islamic, and Lois Lerner and the IRS is not corrupt. Obama is such a freaking 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I can't say that word. Joe Wilson said that, and it was found not to be appropriate. Uh, another, ISIL is not Islamic. Is he kidding? I suppose those black flags are just for giggles then. Another from the CNN article, ISIL is not Islamic. POTUS opens a section aimed at motivating Muslims around the world to disown ISIL and, U and aid U.S. fight. Another from Mohammed Ansar, ISIL is not Islamic, says primetime at Barack Obama, and virtually every Muslim and reasonably educated person on the face of our planet. Michael Oliaga, some folks on Twitter didn't understand Obama's ISIL is not Islamic statement. Study foreign affairs, folks, or religion, all religion. Well, it's interesting because President Obama's statement there is apparently similar to the historic reaction that Thomas Jefferson had before he was president when he was negotiating when the with the radical Islamists, Barbary pirates in northern Africa, who had been capturing American ships, killing, enslaving, holding for ransom. And Jefferson was rather shocked that and when he purportedly indicated, you know, I, I don't understand why you keep attacking us. We don't have a navy. We're not a threat to you. And it was explained to him that we believe that if we're killed attacking infidels like you, then um, we go instantly to paradise. Jefferson's perplexed and uh, ends up getting a copy, his own copy of the Quran, because he couldn't believe that any religion would ever promote going to paradise uh, for, ki for being killed while killing innocent people and read for himself. And history can tell you exactly what his conclusion was. As president, he ultimately decided the only way to deal with these radical Islamists is not to keep paying 10 to 20 percent of the American budget for ransom to get people back. The solution is to send this new group, this new group called the United States Marines, to the shores of Tripoli to fight the radical Islamists with everything they've got until they yell Unka, uncle, or wiped out and they cease to come after Americans. The president says, I've insisted that additional U.S. action depended on, upon Iraqis forming an inclusive government. Well, that strikes me as strange because if the uh, commander-in-chief's highest priority, as he said at the start of the speech, is the security of the American people, then it begs the question, then why is he so worried about what the Iraq government does if he knows he has to do something to protect the American people? Now, I, I recall, I remember, you know, Senator Obama repeatedly, he came after the, the Bush administration, uh, seemed that uh, he thought little or nothing of the coalition that President George H.W. Bush put together with 43 countries to go in and liberate Kuwait, that he thought even less of the 49 countries that put people and money on the line to support the effort in Iraq, 49 countries. President Obama thought that was not a real coalition, yet they put people, they put money. And now, magically, since he's president, he thinks a coalition of nine countries that he won't name or commit what, what they're going to put into the coalition is somehow better than the 49 countries coalition that President Bush, Bush put together uh, before going into the Middle East. Uh, President Obama said, in June, I deployed several hundred American service members to Iraq. Then he goes on to say, we'll send an additional 475 service members to Iraq. Well, he's made very clear He's not going to send 
boots, not going to put boots on the ground, as he said, in Iraq. So the only conclusion that you can make from the president saying, on the one hand, we're not going to put boots on the ground in Iraq, and that he's already sent several hundred uh, soldiers, sending 475 more, the only conclusion logically is that those thousand or so U.S. soldiers will be wearing sneakers. He said that America will be joined by a broad coalition of partners. It's hard to believe that nine people that are a bit timid about being named and committed to what they'll do is really that broad of a coalition. He said that, um, quote, mobilize partners wherever possible to address broader challenges. Mr. Speaker, as we've heard from General Kelly testifying before the House and the Senate, he's the commander of SOUTHCOM, the Southern Command. He knows what threats are to our South. As he testified, the penetration of our southern border by the criminal networks and radical Islamists, in his words, is an existential threat to the United States. You've got the man that's supposed to know the most about the southern border and protecting us telling Congress that the penetration going on of our southern border is a threat to the very existence of the United States of America. So I would urge the President, Mr. Speaker, when he says he'll mobilize partners wherever possible to address broader challenges, that he should change that word in his teleprompter to read border challenges so that we can protect ourselves from the criminal networks and the potential for radical Islamists who want to destroy us coming across our southern border. I truly hope that Tom Clancy, the late Tom Clancy, was not as clairvoyant in one of his last novels as he was in the early 90s when he wrote about someone irritated with the United States flying a jet into the Capitol to wipe out a joint session of Congress. Uh, I love George W. Bush, but when he said, who would ever thought somebody would use a plane for a bomb and crash it into a building? I'm thinking, well, Tom Clancy, several years ago, that was in one of his novels. Well, in one of his recent novels, one of his last, uh, he wrote about a coalition beginning to form between radical Islamists and drug cartels in Mexico, and ultimately a deal where they brought, I can't remember, 10 or 12 radical Islamists with surface air miss missiles. They paid tremendously to the drug cartels to smuggle those into the United States so they could get in cell phone areas in vans and at the appropriate time all across the country step out and shoot down American passenger planes. Now, we know that although the radical Islamists are really insane, crazy when it comes to the killing of innocent people, but they are not stupid. When we give them an opening to come after us, they will take it. So, as the president lost further credibility last night at a time when he really needed to be getting the world behind him, credibility was lost when he said, and I quote, it is America that has rallied the world against Russian aggression and in support of the Ukrainian people's right to determine their own destiny. Mr. Speaker, People around the world, as I've traveled in, in West Africa, North Africa, 
Middle East, moderate Muslim countries in the Middle East, Af Afghanistan, uh, in Europe, they all understand that this president has done virtually nothing to help Ukraine. They haven't rallied the peoples of the world. And when the people around the world hear that, they have to think, what? Does he think we're crazy ourselves? You go back and see what this administration did in response to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And the response was a Twitter campaign and, and a, um, um, they actually did try to put restrictions on, a, as I recall, 10 or 11 bank accounts that the Russians laughed about. This president needs to do more to rally the public, uh, rally the world around us with us against radical Islam, against imperialism like we've seen from Putin. And we can all stand together. I, after the president seemed to indicate that he wanted to take out ISIS, or he said ISIL, uh, I really felt that when the president had finished last night that I would be saying, that's something I got to support. I'm with him. ISIS has said they're a threat to us. We need to take them seriously. They're cutting off American heads. We got to take that seriously. And yet, when I hear the president, he wants to give support to the moderate, vetted, free Syrian army. And we read the article from Patrick Poole where he quotes one of those vetted, moderate, free Syrian army brigade commander saying that his forces were working with the Islamic State and Javad al-Nusra, al-Qaeda's official Syrian affiliate, both U.S. designated terrorist organizations. And, and in quotes, we are collaborating with the Islamic State and the Nusra Front by attacking the Syrian army's gatherings in Kalamun. And another quote from another free Syrian army commander, vetted, moderate, that this president's going to help. Quote, we have reached a point where we have to collaborate with anyone against unfairness and injustice. Let's face it, the Nusra Front is the biggest power present right now in Kulaman, and we as FSA should collaborate with any mission they launch as long as it coincides with our values. I really expected to be standing today and saying we need to get behind the president's activity. Just as I said um, in the last couple of weeks, immediately after the president's speech, I agree, let's go to war with ISIS. But with the president wanting to continue what he's been doing for over a year, giving weapons to the free Syrian army, who somehow magically keep having them taken away by the Islamic State or ISIS, ISIL, and the president himself, they finally suspended giving them more arms in December because we kept, this president kept sending arms to the vetted moderate free Syrians. They end up in the hands of ISIS every time. And so it was suspended in December. But then in April, for some reason, they think they can now trust the free Syrians. So he starts sending more weapons to the free Syrians and magically they keep ending up in the ISIS, ISIL control. And now this president does a speech last night and we're supposed to get with him and send more weapons to the people whose leaders are saying publicly, we support ISIS, we support al-Nusra, we support the enemies of the United States. I yield to my friend from Georgia. Well, I want to <clears throat> I want to thank the gentleman from Texas for uh, doing this special order and for giving me an opportunity to come down and not only listen to him but share a little bit. And I think uh, you know that uh, we 
could have learned a lesson uh, from Libya in the fact that uh, we gave air support uh, to the rebel groups that were um, overthrowing Gaddafi, that wanted Gaddafi gone. Was Gaddafi a good man? Nope. But his enemies were the same as our enemies. And he had uh, really turned over his uh, nuclear uh, arms, his chemical weapons. Uh, I mean, st he had st stopped with his nuclear uh, uh, enhancement uh, and turned over his uh, uh, chemical weapons. And yet uh, we saw it fit that we would help uh, uh, the rebels uh, because of humanitarian uh, reasons on what was going on. You know, sometimes uh, different sides get blamed for different things uh, by just saying, oh, we didn't do that. Somebody else did that. And you know, it's interesting uh, that after Gaddafi was gone, all of a sudden it becomes a wild west in Libya. And as a result of that, we had four brave Americans lose their life in Benghazi because we were trying to play nice and be friends. Uh, some people don't want to be our friend. Uh, in fact, uh, as uh, the gentleman from Texas was talking about, the real ambition of these jihadist groups, these radical Islamic groups, is to really have Sharia law control the world. They want all of us to be under the Sharia law, and that's, that's, where, that's what their goal is. In fact, if you look at ISIL, the Islamic, uh, Islamic State of Iraq and the Lebanon, they want to go back in history and put together this caliphate that would include Israel, Lebanon, Turkey, and others. I mean, that is their goal. And, you know, for people that might get confused, you know, ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, uh, there's a lot of different names uh, that uh, uh, this group is called. I think the ISIL is the best because I think that describes their intent of uh, gaining this area uh, that was once held. So I think we have to really think about this as far as who we are going to train and arm. Do we know who these groups really are? There's a gentleman from Texas uh, read about the article that Patrick Poole had. Uh, and, you know, uh, we have, we've, we've had fighters that, that went to Syria. In fact, we just had our first uh, American fighter that uh, was fighting for ISIL. I believe his name was Mr. McCain. Uh, lived in Minneapolis, went back and forth to San Diego, finally ended up in Syria. Uh, I think Josh Ernest uh, used in one of the press briefings that uh, these moderate forces had killed uh, uh, Mr. McCain and uh, that they were fighting both ISIL and Assad. Now, the interesting thing about this moderate opposition group that uh, killed Mr. McCain is that they killed other uh, ISIL fighters, too. They beheaded six of them. Now, I don't know how moderate that is, but according to American standards, that's not moderate. And so I think we really have to give some close scrutiny to these folks that uh, uh, we're going to arm, uh, that we're going to give them uh, different weapons that uh, we really don't have a list of what those weapons would be yet. Uh, we're going to let the military train them. And, you know, um, we train the Iraqi military, uh, military their police, their defense force um, for what seven years, I guess, or longer, and uh, and then at the first sight of combat, they left the American equipment that they had been given um, and fled. Uh, so I don't know what kind of training we're going to give these uh, uh, 
moderate groups, but uh, I know we haven't got seven years to stop ISIL. And so I agree with my friend, Mr. Gomer, that uh, I wish the, the president had used some different words than rather than degrade, maybe destroy, maybe defeat would have been a great word to use, that we want to defeat them. And, you know, if you read the open source reports, there's 10,000. And then you hear, well, now there's 15,000. Then we've got people in the military or in the government saying, well, there could be up to 30,000. We don't know how many there are. But I promise you, whether it was 30 or 50, um, we've got the greatest military in the world. And we could control that situation if we just had the fortitude and the guts to do it. But because of the incisive, indecisiveness of this president, this thing has festered. If we had gone, I think, into Syria originally, as, uh, or, or at least armed the, the opposition forces in, we actually knew who they were because they were a small group. There's probably over 100 different uh, opposition forces. And as the gentleman said, um, they're fighting both Assad and uh, ISIL. Now, to me, it's real confusing over there about who's fighting who. You know, if you look at Hamas and in the, and, and the Lebanese army teaming up with them and Assad to, to drive out the rebels that Assad had uh, driven into Lebanon, uh, it's real confusing about who's on whose side. We need to be particularly aware of that and make sure that we have a vetting process, if it's even possible, uh, that we have a vetting process to, to make sure that these people uh, are worthy of uh, getting the assistance from the American taxpayer. And with well, that, I'll yield well, back to I'd the like gentleman. to ask the gentleman a question, if he has time for one, because I'm struggling a little bit. Um, the Byron York has a, a good article out, um, he published last night, 1146. Um, but he points out that there are some real potential problems. He says five things that could go horribly wrong with Obama's action in Iraq. Uh, one of them, he mentions the lack of a status of forces agreement. Uh, we all know President Bush had been working on a status of forces agreement. He thought he would leave it to the president to accomplish that great task and have instant in international credibility for signing a document immediately like that coming into office. But for whatever reason, we hear a lot of different stories, but it blew up. But the president had says that, you know, we we couldn't leave troops there without a status of forces agreement because you can't have troops in a country where you don't have, for example, an immunity agreement so that uh, American soldiers, American contractors that are there to help protect Iraq from, from uh, harm, uh, sometimes bombs go off in the wrong place, sometimes somebody gets killed that wasn't meant to because it's, it becomes a war zone. And as the President points out, pointed out before, we couldn't leave troops there because we have no immunity agreement. Well, I haven't heard that there's any immunity agreement with Iraq, and yet he announced last night he's already got several hundred American sneakers on the ground over there and going to add 475 more troops, apparently wearing sneakers because they're not boots on the ground. So... I'm, I'm needing some help here. Why is it safe to send in American troops now without the promise, the agreement of immunity from Iraq when it was not safe to do so when he took office? I, I'm struggling here. Well, and, and you should because it was all Bush's fault. <laughs> it was all the prior administration's fault yeah. that this happened. And by the withdrawal of our troops, because I'm telling you, uh, I think President Bush laid it out pretty clear in 2007 when he made that speech about 
you know, a lot of people in Washington were clamoring about getting our troops out, and he said, we're not going to get our troops out to our ground commanders in Iraq tell us that it, we're ready to get our troops out. And he points out the dangers of that, and that's exactly what happened. And I think if this uh, administration had understood that and had actually uh, listened to the former president uh, and that had been involved in all the things that were recently had gone on in the Middle East, then they would have been persistent enough to persuade Maliki to allow for some agreement. Now, you know, I, I, I don't understand all the politics that has gone into this, but we certainly do. I think last night he authorized another 475 uh, sneakers on the ground, and uh, I think there was already roughly, what, 900 and something over there. So we have a lot of guys over there, but we don't know what they're doing, and I don't know that they know what they're doing. <laughs> um, you know, what's the rules of engagement? I mean, uh, are they carrying weapons? Are they carrying notebooks, iPads? Uh, what are they doing? And, I mean, these are some of the most trained, well-trained uh, people that we have in our military. These are, these are valuable assets to us that are over there. And, I, you know, just from the reports I read, I don't see that they really have any operational plan uh, that they're going with. And so that's got to be... That's got to be really confusing, I would think, if I was over there uh, as to what the rules of engagement were and, uh, you know, if I was going to be uh, sent out as an advisor or uh, just a protection of security forces for the Americans that's there, Herbal or uh, Baghdad or wherever they're at. So uh, I think it's confusing to them, too. And so uh, I think that uh, that's the reason, as you mentioned uh, in one of your speeches today that I heard about the resolution. So we can actually define what we think and what our committees think would be a good uh, military plan for going in and what the expectations was of any forces uh, that, that we have over there, whether it's air or uh, some of these uh, uh, boots on the ground is uh, let's clarify that and make that a separate vote. Well, um, it, I think it's worth pointing out what concerns many others in the world, and that is the judgment of this administration. As we travel around the world, we have allies who talk to us privately, leaders in countries in the Middle East, moderate Muslims, people in Israel, and they keep asking about the judgment of this country, of the national leaders, and everybody knows that this president agreed to release five Taliban terrorists complicit with murder, and the uh, statement has come out now, uh, well, August 27th. This is after the release of, this, of five Taliban murders by this administration. This statement has gone out, and it, it's in their language, but the translation says, in part, we consider ISIS and every other Mujahid group as our brothers. Uh, that that's kind of important to understand when he released the Taliban five they don't have a problem with cutting people's heads off or their friends cutting people's heads off they support ISIS and he did so in violation of the law it required that there could be not one dime of American money spent to release somebody from Guantanamo uh, unless the law was complied with, and the law required notice of by 30 days to people in Congress, and that didn't happen. He broke the law in order to help the lawbreakers. So people around the world see that, and they're puzzled. 
And I happened to be standing here in the house floor with one of the two other people that went to the FBI uh, disclosure. They classified it, which I thought was ridiculous. We wanted to see the documents that the FBI and their uh, advisors on Islam had uh, purged from the FBI training materials. Now, these are the materials that train FBI agents, the kind of people that have to go talk to Sarniev and his mother and people at the mosque and friends and have to know the questions and what to look for that might indicate this person has been radicalized. Now, since they classified those materials they purged, we went through them, but we don't get it. We don't get to disclose what's in them. But we can say, I can say I was shocked at how ridiculous some of the purging was. Uh, some things were purely from, well, some of them were so clearly important that people trying to learn about radical Islam, it was important that they know and understand. So you, once you understand that there's been that kind of purging of material, uh, then you begin to understand how this administration could get two, not one, two heads up from a country like Russia that Sarniev was radicalized, he could kill people, you better watch him, you better check on him, he's dangerous, he's going to hurt people, and they do nothing meaningful about it. As we found out through hearing in judiciary, at first Mueller said, we did go to those mosques, but it turns out he said it was on their outreach program. They never went out there to see uh, whether they were radicalized. And then um, we knew at the time, um, Mr. Speaker, I, I hold here the articles from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Articles of Organization for the Islamic um, Society of Boston. And this Islamic Society of Boston is the one that organized the two mosques. And the organizing official is a man named Alamudi, which was familiar to the FBI director because on his watch, uh, although he had helped the Clinton administration hire what were thought to be moderate Muslims in the Clinton administration, uh, and he had originally had an agreement to be of assistance to the Bush administration, uh, the Bush administration ultimately finds out he's supporting terrorism. They have him arrested out here at Dulles Airport, and he's now doing 23 years in prison for supporting terrorism. He's the one that organized the Islamic Society of Boston that created the two mosques where the Sarniavs went. And the FBI didn't even know that a guy they helped convict of supporting terrorism started the mosque that has terrorized, that, it, that has created terrorists out of uh, more than one person. There are others that we find out that have had relations uh, with that mosque that may be a threat. But one other thing I want to mention before I yield to my friend, uh, we have a chart. I've had a blow-up of this used before, but it points out how many times, because uh, as this points out, terminology is important in defining our goals. The 9-11 Commission identifies Islamist terrorism as the threat the Muslim Public Affairs Council recommends that the U.S. government find other terminology. So in the 9-11 Commission report, bipartisan, bicameral, people trying to take an objective look, they use the term 322 times in the 9-11 Commission report. However, at the last FBI counterterrorism lexicon, uh, does not include the word Islam. The National Intelligence Strategy of 2009 does not include the word Islam. 
In the 9-11 Commission report, it used the word Muslim 145 times. But since then, under this administration, the FBI counterterrorism lexicon doesn't use the word Muslim. It doesn't use the word jihad. It doesn't use the word enemy. Um, now, it does use the words violent extremism 29 times. Uh, in the 9-11 Commission report, it uses the word religious, and it's normally referencing these radical Islamists. It uses that word religious 65 times, whereas the FBI counterterrorism lexicon only uses it three times. And then the president, basically the only time he used it last night was to say that people that call themselves Islamists are not religious. The people that have had their heads cut off by these pay people in the name of Islam um, are looking at what we're doing, I believe, and wondering, how can you say that was not, in their minds, a religious act to cut off my head? I think, as a Christian, there are references in the Bible. I think people know what goes on here. We know from Scripture that uh, there's rejoicing in heaven over one soul being saved. Well, how could they rejoice unless they know what's going on? So I, I think people that have had their heads cut off uh, would have to be wondering about the president's assessment. Al-Qaeda was used 36 times in the 9-11 Commission report, but in the FBI counterterrorism lexicon, not used at all. In the National Intelligence Strategy of 2009 under this administration, it's used once. Caliph, uh, that's not, not used at all by this administration in their FBI counterterrorism lexicon, National Intelligence Strategy of 2009. The 9-11 Commission report used it seven times. And it's a, a little more understandable, too, when you, you find out that uh, one of the advisors on the Homeland Security Advisory Council that Janet Napolitano put there and gave a secret uh, clearance. Uh, it was named uh, Mohammed Alibiari. Uh, here's an article uh, from Adam Credo, and he quotes a tweet sent out by the Homeland Security Advisory advisory council member, and the tweet says, the caliphate will return, that is inevitable. Well, we know now that the Homeland Security Advisory Council member's tweet has been used by ISIS as recruiting that even this president's close advisor on Homeland Security, uh, with that he has secret access to our databases uh, given by this administration, that he's out there saying the caliphate's inevitable. And so it is being used to recruit people to kill Americans. The Homeland Security Advisory Council has people helping with recruiting for terrorists to kill Americans. I yield to my friend. Well, I, I just want to say, you know, uh, when uh, the five of us uh, went in that 12 by 12 room. I think there were with, just three members of Congress. Was it just three? Michelle, but then there were two FBI agents sitting there, too. Well, there was one more member, I know, but Trent. Oh, yeah. that's right. Trent came from yeah. the first So there part. were yeah. four of us in a 12 right. by 12 and two FBI agents and several boxes of uh, paperwork, and they were nice enough to bring one copy <laughs> so we could share. Uh, but the FBI is the greatest, uh, I mean, they're great crime fighters. I mean, they, they do great investigative work, and I think it was probably under great political pressure that they purged uh, uh, these documents to uh, take those um, uh, words out of it like you said, even the 9-11 Commission uh, did that. I want to go back to what you said about our, our allies and indecisiveness, if I could. You know, Louis, we, we, 
uh, or we look at what's going on in the country, and we all talk to small business people every day, and they go, you know what? We're not going to expand our business. We're not going to uh, grow because we don't know what our health insurance is going to be. We don't know what our energy cost is going to be. We don't know what the regulations are going to be. Uh, you know, and so it's kind of a stalemate. And I think that's the way our allies look at us. They don't know what our next move is. And so with all this uncertainty, there are different elements that are coming in and filling that void uh, in us being the world leader. Russia being one of them, coming in to fill that void. And people like, people like to know that there's a leader somewhere that they can follow. And I just don't think our allies in this world have seen that. And now we've actually got Germany uh, and France and others leading different parts of these charges uh, where America should have been uh, out in front of it. So I know our time's just about up. I want to thank my friend from Texas uh, for allowing me to share uh, with him. I look forward to uh, doing some more of the special orders with uh, him and uh, – make sure we can get the truth out. So I well, thank you. And I do thank my friend, but I've got another article here that accentuates what my friend from Georgia was saying uh, about our allies not being sure what we're going to do. Unfortunately, our enemies seem to know very well what we're going to do. As an article published by Al Bawaba, um, published today says, and, and we've identified Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. Well, the deputy leader of Hezbollah, Sheikh Nam Qasim, has said, quote, the flurry of international activity which is sponsored by the U.S. is not serious in ending the Takfari threat. He said, Obama spoke of, quote, containing, unquote, the threat and not, quote, stopping it. And I'm quoting from him, comments made by Barack Obama are clear. The word contain means to identify risk and dis disable some of its objectives while maintaining this terrorist organization's role uh, to frighten certain countries in this region and to keep this risk as a scarecrow in appropriate places to make political gains, particularly in Iraq and Syria. Our enemies know that this president's speech last night indicated he's not serious. We've got to get serious. And with that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Members are reminded not to engage in personalities toward the president. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2013, the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, I come to the floor today as the House has adjourned uh, because on Monday a very important hearing, the first of its kind in two decades, a hearing on statehood for the District of Columbia will take place in the Senate of the United States. Uh, this, the hearing is called by Senator Carper, the chair of the Jurisdictional Committee. Um, this hearing takes place 
uh, at a time and in a season when we have seen unusual progress for statehood for the District of Columbia. Uh, in the Senate, the majority leader himself became a co-sponsor of the bill, uh, indeed announced it with great uh, excitement. Uh, very unusual because the majority leader of the Senate co-sponsors very few bills. The top leadership of the Senate are sponsors of the bill. Um, the bill has more House and Senate sponsors than it has ever had. That's normally called momentum, uh, Mr. Speaker. Now, when I say we, we're having the first Senate hearing in um, two decades, it's not because uh, we haven't tried to get a Senate hearing or because a Senate or House hearing on statehood was what was on the agenda for the immediate period. To be sure, uh, the D District of Columbia residents have tried many ways to get their equal rights to other American citizens. There's been a House Voting Rights Act. I would have the vote on the House floor as I speak uh, had an amendment not sought to wipe away all the gun laws of the District of Columbia. There have been bills for House and Senate votes. There have been bills for budget autonomy, and we still seek budget autonomy. Uh, through all of this, we have always sought statehood for the District of Columbia because, Mr. Speaker, there is no way for the district to get the same rights that every other American has without statehood. And I will go into that uh, a, a little later. Uh, our bill, uh, the hearing, I'm sorry, the hearing uh, is entitled Equality for the District of Columbia, discussing the implications of S-132, the New Columbia Admissions Act. Uh, that is the companion bill to my bill here in the House, H.R. 292. I want to take a moment just to thank Senator Tom Carper, who is the new chair of uh, the Committee of Jurisdiction, uh, the Senate uh, Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee. And as you might expect, uh, that committee has a lot on its plate, and yet in only his first term as chair, Senator Carper has made uh, many strides forward and always been uh, very helpful to the District of Columbia and now culminates the work that he and I have done in the Senate with a hearing, a hearing that we of course requested, but a hearing that he had to find time for on a, on a very busy agenda. I cannot thank him enough in the name of the people of the District of Columbia for affording us the opportunity to be heard. We do not pretend that statehood is around the corner. We do know this, that if we do not continue to use vehicles like hearings to put the matter before uh, the House and the Senate and before the people of the United States, we cannot build to the point where we can achieve what we will achieve, which is statehood for uh, the 650,000 people who live in the nation's capital. Um, I do want to say, when I say this is the first hearing, I do want to say that Senator Joe Lieberman, was, who was the prior chairman of the Senate Homeland and Government Affairs Committee, was also a great champion for statehood, and he actually, while he didn't have a hearing, he did have a markup uh, for statehood. Uh, and yet we, and, and indeed there was a hearing for statehood when my first bill, the bill when I first came to Congress in the early 90s came to the floor and we got the first and only vote for statehood for the District of Columbia. 
There was a Senate hearing. It was not a jurisdictional hearing, and that's what this hearing is. Therefore, it is a landmark hearing. It is a historic hearing, and that's why I felt it merited my coming to the House floor today. On top of that momentum uh, that we have now seen in the Senate, and I shouldn't leave this subject without uh, mentioning the, mo the momentum that has been here in the House. We have Republican and Democratic uh, s support for budget autonomy for the District of Columbia, for example. That is a very essential element of statehood, that it's your own budget, your own local funds, and nobody gets to look at it but you, the, your own jurisdiction. That's not what the district has now. That's what there are Republicans and Democrats who believe we should indeed have. There's not yet the kind of support for statehood that I expect to see in the House of Representatives, but we will be glad to work with the Senate and win the House when it lives up to its own principles, that every American is entitled to be treated equally in the Congress and in our country. Quite aside from uh, the progress we have seen in the House and the Senate on statehood and on the elements, the particular elements of statehood, we now have the formal endorsement of the President of the United States for statehood. And I would like to quote what he said when he endorsed the bill. I've long believed that, D that DC pay, folks in D.C. pay taxes like everybody else. They contribute to the overall well-being of the country like everybody else. They should be represented like everybody else. It's not as if Washington is not big enough compared with other states. It's absolutely the right thing to do, and uh, end quote. And I'll have, a, I'll have something to say about the population of the District of Columbia as compared with other states in a few minutes. Now, of course, I wasn't surprised that the President of the United States supported statehood. And the reason I wasn't surprised is because he has long supported and been on record as supporting all of the elements of statehood. Uh, budget autonomy, the right of the people of the District of Columbia who raise $8 billion to spend their own money without coming to this chamber, which has raised not one penny of it. He has long supported that and has put that in his own budget. Legislative autonomy, so that the Congress doesn't have some say over the District of Columbia's laws. The president has put that in, in, in his uh, own budget. And the president, going back to the time that he was in the Senate of the United States, supported voting rights for the District of Columbia. So there you have it, voting rights, legislative autonomy, uh, budget autonomy, the elements of statehood. We have members of this House and of the Senate who have long supported all of them. We want to bring it all together with support of statehood for the District of Columbia. So there shall be then a historic here hearing at, I believe it is 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon, with witnesses who are particularly able to speak to the issues. Uh, Professor Viet Zen uh, of Georgetown uh, Law School, he's a professor of constitutional law a former U.S. Assistant Attorney for Legal Policy in the Bush administration. That made him the highest policy official in the Bush administration. Uh, he has previously testified here in, the House, here in the House about the constitutionality of the voting rights, the D.C. House Voting Rights Act, he will testify as to the constitutionality of our statehood bill. Uh, Alice Rivlin, who, uh, of course, was a vice chair of the Federal Reserve Board, a director of the White House Office of Management and Budget, and finally, uh, as a D.C. resident, was called upon by the president uh, to chair the Financial Control Board of the District of Columbia, 
uh, will testify at that hearing. Now, of course, Dr. Rivlin is a expert on the nation's uh, uh, economy and on the finances of the District of Columbia. We're very pleased that Wade Henderson of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights will also testify, longtime champion of, of statehood and equal rights for the District of Columbia. Uh, the elected officials of the District of Columbia will testify, of course, the mayor, uh, the chair of the city council, and I also the statehood delegation. At the same time uh, that we have been pressing on what amounts to two tracks for statehood, we have been making the progress I have indicated on the elements of statehood, such as budget and legislative or autonomy. Uh, in this house, we've got to work on what we need to work on all at the same time. There's no sequential uh, matter when it comes to the many rights that the residents of the District of Columbia are, are denied. Um, with, with the many things on which we have struggled for equality, one at a time, sometimes two or three at a time, statehood has always been <laughs> what the residents, the American citizens who live in the District of Columbia have needed and wanted. And it is during this Congress that statehood has gotten its great footing. Uh, I do want to uh, thank the growing statehood movement and coalition, uh, the many residents who struggle uh, for statehood and have helped us in so many ways, including many in the statehood coalition who went around asking for co-sponsors. But I think among the reasons that statehood has gotten so much <laughs> momentum this year is that, you know, the residents of the District of Columbia are kind of fed up uh, with paying such high federal taxes without equal representation in the Congress of the United States. They have simply had it on second-class citizenship. As if to dramatize what it means to be a second-class citizen, there were several violations of the rights of the people who live in the District of Columbia as American citizens this year, which highlighted the need for statehood. The House actually passed two provisions that would overturn laws passed by the residents of the District of Columbia laws that were local entirely in their nature. Imagine what would happen if the Congress tried to pass a law to overturn some law in Maryland or Virginia or Oklahoma or Utah or California or New Hampshire. People would think the Congress had lost its mind. Because of the anomaly of the stature, status rather, of the District of Columbia as a district and not a state, the Congress can meddle in, if you will forgive me, the local business of the District of Columbia. So two members decided to, and in fact got passed in this House, bills that overturned our, our local laws. I'm pleased to say that as of now, those bills uh, have not seen and will not be passed uh, in the continuing re resolution that is pending in the House or the Senate. So thus far, we have been successful despite the passage of these two bills. One of them passed by Representative Tom Massey, a Republican who lives in Kentucky. He lives in a county of 11,000 people, has sought and actually got passed in the House, something I had to get taken out, a bill that would keep the District of Columbia, which has 650,000 people, from having any gun laws. None. 
all the local gun laws would be gone. This is a big city, people. The reason big cities have gun laws of the kind that you will not find in Kentucky is because of the difference, the differences we all respect in our country. Moreover, public safety, think about it, is the quintessential local concern. You depend upon your own local officials who know you both, who know you best, whom you've elected to deal first and foremost with public safety. Nobody will try to tell somebody what to do about public safety in its own district. And yet, that's what Representative Massey tried to do. This in spite of the fact that in 1973, not yet for statehood, the Congress of the United States recognizing how un-American it was to try to pass laws or interfere with the laws of a local jurisdiction devolved local lawmaking authority to the residents of the District of Columbia. And until this year, most members on both sides of the aisle had respected that. To be sure, we've had to fight them off in prior years, but we had a long run where nobody tried to interfere with the local laws of the District of Columbia. This was surprising to, for us that Representative Massey, who is a Tea Party Republican who stands first and foremost for localism, <laughs> would forget those principles when it came to the District of Columbia uh, and uh, try to interfere with local matters in this city. We had the same thing happen to uh, another colleague, a Republican from Maryland who should have known better, who has a particular distaste for uh, the decriminalization of marijuana laws that is going on all over the United States, 18 states so far, legalization in two states. So he tries to get a law, indeed got a law that we now have kept from getting through the Senate uh, that uh, would uh, block the district's recently passed marijuana decriminalization law. What this means is that uh, there would be a fine uh, rather than a, a, um, a conviction for possessing marijuana. <laughs> the district didn't do it, by the way, for the reasons that some states, the 18 states, perhaps some of them did it, uh, although some of them may have done it for the same reason we did it. Blacks and whites use uh, marijuana at the same rate in the United States. In the district, 90% of those who uh, had criminal convictions for possessing small amounts of marijuana were black. You know, half the population is black, half is white. Uh, these laws have had an a, 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 a obvious racial effect uh, I'm not for smoking anything, <laughs> but I must tell you, uh, I also don't believe that people ought to have a criminal conviction because they possessed it any more than they have a criminal conviction for possessing alcohol. And in any, in any case, whatever you think, <laughs> it's not your business. It's a local matter. And the district ought to have the same right when it comes to local matters as anybody else has. This was Representative Andy Harris, and what was ironic about his trying to block the district's marijuana decriminalization law is that his own, he couldn't block it in his own state, Maryland, which has decriminalized uh, marijuana. But perhaps what points it up most, the need for statehood, is what the district went through this past appropriation period when it almost got shut down. Not because of anything the city had done, but because this House and this Senate shut down. The district was an innocent bystander, but because the Congress still, <laughs> still 
requires that the district's local budget pass through this House and Senate, the budget was up here. I'm telling you, it is a budget, $8 billion raised by the people and the businesses I represent. Not one dime of it, federal money. A balanced budget, the likes of which the federal government has not seen since the Clinton administration. $1.5 billion in reserve, and there is virtually no state in the union that has that kind of reserves. And yet, when the federal government shut down, the District of Columbia was in jeopardy of shutting down. This despite the fact that I have a shutdown avoidance bill that shut that avoidance was in the president's budget but not passed. The mayor did the right thing for the first time in American history. He refused to shut down. What you going to do to him? What he did instead was to, you, to keep the district open but pay for our employees and our services out of contingency funds. Those funds were almost exhausted before the federal government finally opened up and the district uh, didn't have to worry about spending its contingency funds. Yeah, you, you face citizens with that kind of, of, of a challenge over time, you obviously, they, they begin to feel that they have to find a remedy. Yes, residents have been trying to find a remedy for 200 years. And there are interesting historical reasons why it hasn't happened. But whatever those reasons are, the time is at hand when it is impossible to call yourself the United States of America who believes in equality in the way citizens are treated throughout the world and not begin to apply that same principle to the people who live in your own nation's capital. So we have been preparing for this hearing for some time. Uh, we, we took particular pains on what is called DC Emancipation Day. DC uh, celebrates this day, April 16th every year, because it's the day that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves in the District of Columbia before the slaves were freed in other parts of the country is kind of the district's way of saying uh, there's a kind of, of, of absence of freedom that still exists in your own uh, nation's capital. As we, as Emancipation Day came, by chance, the UN Human Rights Committee uh, issued a report indicating that the denial of voting rights in the House and Senate to the residents of the District of Columbia was a violation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a treaty which the United States signed in 1992. So let's be clear. By not granting equal citizenship rights to the people who live in the nation's capital, the United States, this Congress, is in violation of international law. On Emancipation Day, I did not come to the floor to speak about the slaves. <laughs> that was then. This is now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting because my great-grandfather was a one-way slave from Virginia and was in the District of Columbia on Emancipation Day. But Emancipation Day cannot be about nostalgia. And the residents of the District of Columbia put it to good use. And I thought what I ought to do was to, in preparation for I, what I knew Senator Carper wanted to do, to come to the floor to speak about why we should have statehood. What, what is it? What is it about the residents of the District of Columbia that merited statehood? Well, first, 
Yeah, let's start with, a, with the most elementary of qualifications. A and that is the population. Yes, this is a city. Yes, it's called a district. It's the District of Columbia. But, and yes, we have a population equal to, but in this case, larger than the population of two states that have two senators uh, and, by the way, a member, one member to represent the entire state, just like I represent the residents of the District of Columbia, Vermont, and Wyoming, one in the West and one in the East. What does that say to you? It said the residents believed in, the framers believed in equality. They wanted everybody to have representation in the House and the Senate. And when there was a dispute between the large and the small states, uh, they made a compromise and gave the small states equal representation in the House and what amounts to per capita re representation here. So there's no question that you have enough people here. Now, I've mentioned these states because we are larger than those states, but the half a dozen states uh, which, which have population about equal to the District of Columbia. That's the first qualification. But let's take a look at the one <laughs> that would probably get the attention of more Americans than any others. And that is the taxes paid on our license plate. Uh, you will see the words taxation without representation. Uh, let's put that to dollars and cents. We're not just talking about paying taxes without representation. I'm talking about paying more taxes per capita than any other jurisdiction without representation. Almost $12,000 per resident of the District of Columbia in taxes paid to support the federal government, which does not reciprocate with voting representation in the House and the Senate. I have the voting committee. I, as the representative of the District of Columbia, I have the same rights to come to this floor and to do everything else that other members do, except that which is emblematic of my citizenship and the citizenship of the people I represent. And that, of course, is the vote on the last vote on the House floor. $12,000. Now, I have not, this is simply a graph to show you the vast differences in taxes per capita paid throughout the United States. It goes from $12,000 down to Mississippi, which pays, those citizens pay $4,000 per capita to the federal government with the same writes that those who pay more, as should be the case, and it should also be the case that those of us who live in the nation's capital who pay more and more than all others should have the same rights as all others. Just to dig down into what this means a, a little bit, uh, Vermont, which I indicated is a state somewhat smaller than the district, uh, pays about half the taxes, $6,000 uh, per resident. Um, Wyoming 
pays eight thousand dollars per resident compared these are both compared to our twelve thousand um, California uh, if you look at the, at the large states of the Union pays eight thousand dollars per person compared to the District of Columbia's twelve thousand dollars per person but perhaps of of all of the qualifications For statehood, none is more worthy than the sacrifices District of Columbia residents have made throughout the more than 200 years of our existence as the nation's capital for our country. And in, in the wars of the United States, often suffering casualties above and beyond those of states that are considerably larger in population than the District of Columbia. So let's look at just some of them for the major wars, the big wars of the 20th century. World War I, more casualties than three states of the Union. World War II, more casualties than four states of the Union. The Korean War, more casualties than eight states of the Union. The Vietnam War, more casualties than 10 states of the Union. There is on the mall a, a, a memorial for the 635 DC residents who died in World War I. It is in that sacrifice that we feel most dishonored as a jurisdiction. How could our country continue to send our residents to war without granting those who go to war often to get rights for others, the same rights that we afford every citizen of our own country. So all of the elements, the essential elements, even the one that it is hardest to endure, without full equality. All of the elements of citizenship have long been uh, made and by the citizens, by the residents of the District of Columbia. And all of the elements of statehood. So why not statehood? That is a fair question. What was wrong with the framers? Why didn't they make the District of Columbia state in the first place? Well, nothing was wrong with the framers. Um, the District of Columbia is a historic anomaly. It's a figment of history and of an incident in history that could not happen today. The reason the District of Columbia is not a state is an accident of history and an accident that must be corrected. The accident came out of the meeting of the Continental 
Congress in Philadelphia in 1783. There were some angry Revolutionary War soldiers, and so they did what citizens do. They went, I must say, not only to petition the Continental Congress, they brought their guns with them. And while I do, it is not said that a, 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 a shot was fired, they did point <laughs> their guns at the windows where the Continental Congress was meeting. Well, the Pennsylvania and the Philadelphia authorities didn't know what to do. They didn't want to go out after the Revolutionary War heroes. So the Continental Congress says, we better get out of here. So they fled Philadelphia. Well, that stuck in the framers' minds. So, oh my goodness, uh, states are not going to protect us, so I guess we must have a district that is controlled entirely by the federal government. Well, when I say that it is an accident of history, do understand that that history is long gone. The way in which we protect the nation's capital today is the way it would be protected in the event of statehood. You know, the, uh, the federal government, to be sure, and the District of Columbia government, after all, it's the same city as far as we're all concerned get together to protect uh, the district, whether it's from 9-11 uh, or from any other threat. So you can't rest then on any notion that the framers intended to have any residents who did not have equal rights. The existence of a jurisdiction uh, that did not have Full and equal rights was not in the capacity of the framers to envision. Those who fought the Revolutionary War lived in the nation's capital, then parts of Maryland and Virginia, which became the nation's capital. The brilliant framers realized uh, that they did not have all the answers. They had every reason to think that this would be fixed. And one reason we know that they understood that things could get fixed, and shame on us that over 200 years we haven't fixed this moral outrage, one reason we know that they understood it could be fixed is what they did do to make the residents of the nation's capital equal in the first place. During the 10-year transition from the territory in Maryland and Virginia, which was to form the nation's capital, they did not want those residents to be left without their equal rights for even one second. So while they had jurisdiction, they saw to it that during that transition period when they weren't really a part of Maryland and Virginia and weren't really a part of the new capital, they would retain their rights. Those people who lived in Maryland and Virginia on their way to becoming the nation's capital still voted in those two states and had every single right preserved until jurisdiction passed to the United States Congress. And that's when tyranny set in. The tyranny of not having that representation carried over into uh, and under the jurisdiction of the Congress. All the people of the, of the District of Columbia in 1801, when we became the nation's capital, went into the streets to demand their rights. And they have been in the streets ever since, demanding their full rights as any red-blooded Americans would be. Well, Mr. Speaker, we have tried every route, some of it more gradual than others, to pursue, to obtain our full rights as American citizens. We've tried voting rights for the House, voting rights for the House and Senate all kinds of other ways, budget autonomy, legislative autonomy. 
even if we had gotten those, they would have been insufficient. But it says everything about the shortcomings of the Congress that even those insufficient routes to statehood are not yet a part of our law. So this year, there will be a full jurisdictional hearing. And that hearing will take place next Monday. That hearing will set an important guidepost. It will educate many in the Senate and House and many in, the, in, in our country about what, what the, the people of the District of Columbia, the nation's capital, do not now have and what they are entitled to. There can be no doubt that no American would believe that those who pay taxes like they do should not have the same representation in the House and Senate that they do. There isn't any American who would say that the funds that are locally raised in your local jurisdiction uh, should come to the Congress of the United States for any reason. So I do not believe that our problem lies with the people of our country. I do believe that many of them are not fully aware that their own capital is less free than any part of, of our country. Uh, so that what we will hear on next Monday is, is not all the moral reasons, some of them, of course, but also the reasons that go to our creed as Americans and grow, go to practical matters such as whether the government should be able to close down the District of Columbia when they have a disagreement uh, at the federal level among themselves. We will have the practical reasons, not only the moral reasons for statehood, so, Mr. Speaker, in the name of the people I represent, perhaps even more so, in the name of the by now hundreds of thousands of American citizens who happen to live in the District of Columbia, who went to war for their country, Germany, and Vietnam, in Afghanistan and Iraq, but never came home. In the name of those who will once again uh, protect our country now that the President has indicated that we ourselves must take on the fight against ISIS. On this 9-11, as we remember those innocents who died simply because they happened to be in New York and Pennsylvania, I ask, Mr. Speaker, that the Congress remember the 650,000 people who live in the nation's capital are proud of their residency in the District of Columbia many of whom, like me, a third-generation Washingtonian, are proud of her lineage in the nation's capital. In the name of all those I represent, I ask for statehood for the District of Columbia so that our residents may have equal citizenship rights, those same rights which led the founders of our country to create the United States of America. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. The general lady yields back. Under the speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2013, the chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, for 30 minutes.
unanimous consent to address the House for 30 minutes and revise and extend. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to address the events in the Middle East and with ISIS, and I want to address three separate areas. The first is what should be the role of Congress in deciding American policy to these horrific events. Second is to respond to the unjustified attacks on the President of the United States by those who claim he doesn't have a plan, doesn't have a detailed enough plan, doesn't have a perfect plan, or whatever. And the third is to discuss what should be our policy in the Middle East and what dangers there are no matter which policy we pursue. As we try to protect our nation, we should also protect our Constitution. Article I of the Constitution vests in Congress the exclusive duty to decide when we declare war, when we go to war. Article II makes the President of the United States Commander-in-Chief of our Armed Forces. These two provisions need to be reconciled so that both the Congress and the President can make the decisions that the Constitution in charges to them in our foreign and military policy. This is not a new issue. President Jefferson sent our Marines, in the words of the song, to the shores of Tripoli in 1801. This was our first foreign military deployment. This was our first fighting and involvement in the Middle East. And most relevant today, it was the first the use of our military abroad in the absence of a formal declaration of war. Well, what did Thomas Jefferson think was the appropriate congressional role? Thomas Jefferson sought and obtained advance authorization to put our Marines ashore in North Africa. We still face the same constitutional provisions. But several decades ago, we passed the War Powers Act, a reasonable statute that harmonizes the two provisions of the Constitution that I've uh, discussed. The War Powers Act makes it clear that the President can act for 60 or 90 days without the authorization of Congress, but that's it. Beyond those time limits, deployments require congressional authorization. Now, uh, we've heard from the President that he respects Congress, likes us, consults with us, and would welcome our support. But the President, I'm sure, consults with many academics and think tanks and foreign officials, not as a constitutional duty, but just because it makes sense to consult with them. And the President would welcome the support of the Heritage Foundation or uh, the New York Times editorial board for his policies saying that you welcome the support of Congress or that you consult with Congress has nothing to do with the legal rights of Congress and the American people. Now, the President has taken a very unusual legal stance. He asserts broadly last night that he has the authority to, in, to conduct the bombing campaign. But he doesn't have, but he needs Congress to approve training Syrians and providing arms. This stands the Constitution on its head. Uh, the President's, uh, the main decision to be made here is whether we put our pilots and or soldiers in harm's way, whether we wage war and cause casualties and perhaps incur casualties. 
The far less decision, important decision, is whether we uh, train a few hundred or a few thousand Syrians uh, and provide them with weapons. Keep in mind this training and armoring of Syrians has occurred for well over a year without congressional authorization. Uh, what's happening here is the president wants us to vote in favor of his plan, but or to, to, to take a vote of Congress and claim it's a, a vote in favor of his plan, when in fact we would only be voting on the smallest part of that plan, and that is whether, without any risk of casualties to ourselves, without any risk that we'd be directly causing casualties in the Middle East, to provide training uh, to Syrian rebels. Uh, this is uh, hardly what the Constitution uh, requires. Today, in response uh, to uh, my questions, the, dep the President's Deputy National Security Advisor explained for the first time from this administration why they think they have authorization to bomb Iraq and Syria without any further action from Congress. He cited the authorization to use military force passed on this House 13 years ago in response to the tragic events which occurred 13 years ago to this day. When Congress authorized going after al-Qaeda, uh, we never envisioned that uh, that authority would be used in this manner. Just as important, the President's plan is to go after ISIS, which has been repudiated by al-Qaeda, which broke from al-Qaeda, and which wages war against the al-Nusra Front, which is part of al-Qaeda. It is difficult to say that an authorization to use force against al-Qaeda is an authorization to use force against those who are fighting al-Qaeda. But it's a technical argument. On the president's side, you can say that when al-Qaeda al splintered and that all the splinters constitute part of the organization that attacked us 13 years ago to this day. That is why Congress needs to revise the authorization to use military force in 2001. We passed it for one purpose. Is it going to be there for a hundred years? Is it going to authorize things we never imagined? Or shouldn't Congress define what it is we are authorizing under today's circumstance? The other argument raised uh, by the uh, President's national, uh, uh, Deputy National Security Advisor is that the authorization to go to war uh, against Saddam Hussein somehow applies to this situation. Um, a reading of that resolution clearly shows that it is confined to Iraq and would not justify that portion of the President's plan, that a necessary portion that involves uh, bombing Syria. So again, Congress should vote on our authorization to use military force that is crafted to this situation at this time. But it is unlikely that we will do so because there's almost a silent conspiracy here in Washington. Presidents want more power to act as they decide in the national interest without having to ask Congress for, a, for, uh, for uh, authority. And co members of Congress sometimes just want to avoid a tough vote. And so the desire of the president to have all power and the desire of some members of this House to avoid responsibility coincide with the idea of the president just boldly saying he has the authority to enter a new conflict and to enter it for far more than 60 or 90 days, and Congress never has to vote on the matter. And the president, of course, would like to say that he has a vote of Congress in favor of his plan. And so we're going to end up with the sneakiest of all maneuvers. What is likely to occur, and I hope it doesn't, is that we'll vote next week on whether to continue government operations. 
whether to fund the government for the next several months, whether to prevent our national parks from closing. And buried in there will be a provision authorizing and funding the training of Syrian dissidents. And we'll pass that package. The president will claim that since we funded and authorized the training of Syrian dissidents, we voted for his entire plan, including the bombing. And members of Congress can say they had no choice but to vote for the Syrian provision, but didn't actually like it, never really voted for it. They just voted to keep the national parks open. A silent conspiracy of empowerment and shirking responsibility. What we should do next week is have three separate votes. One vote on whether to fund and authorize the arming of Syrians, because the president has asked for that vote. Second, a vote on whether to authorize military force limited exclusively to air forces and not authorizing ground uh, operations. And the third will be, would be a vote to further uh, go further and authorize ground operations. The exact contours of uh, these resolutions should be subject to amendment and o uh, open amendment in this House. We would have to deal with the duration and the exact limitations. But then we would be performing our constitutional duty. Then we would be protecting the American Constitution. I fear that instead we will cleverly avoid responsibility and the president will be able to say, ah, but you voted for, our, for my plan. Now, in defense of the president, I want to respond to the constant harping that the president doesn't have a plan, doesn't have a detailed enough plan, doesn't have a strategy. Well, first, the president put forward a plan, plan last evening. Uh, while Republicans have blasted it as insufficiently detailed, it is just as detailed as the plans put forward by the former president to invade Afghanistan and to invade Iraq. And now keep in mind, as we learn from those wars, whatever plan is put forward is going to be dramatically changed because once you engage in hostilities, things change. Second, if the president were to provide as much detail as some hyper-partisan Republicans are demanding, he would then be attacked for revealing our strategy, our tactics, and classified information. The only thing that holds together this, the, uh, it creates consistency among certain extremist partisan Republicans is that whatever the president does, it's wrong. Uh, then I've got to ask, where is the Republican plan? Have Republicans coalesced around any plan? Have, has any prominent Republican even put forward a plan? Where's your plan? President, Vice President Nick Cheney has not put forward a plan, just an expression of anger and partisanship. Speaker Boehner has not put forward a plan. The Republican-controlled House Armed Services Committee majority has not put forward a plan. And there are a host of think tanks here in Washington that could aid Republicans in drafting a plan, yet the Republicans have yet to even discuss their own plan, let alone coalesce around a Republican plan. Seems like the Republicans do have a plan. Their plan is to reap political advantage from this crisis in the Middle East while avoiding any responsibility for making decisions. The Republicans are politically clever, and when I say Republicans in this speech, I'm referring only to the hyper-partisan Republicans who have engaged in the activities that I describe. The Republic, these Republicans understand that no one can draft the plan the American people really want. Americans want a plan that guarantees the immediate and total destruction of ISIS without significant American casualties. And so hyper-partisan Republicans can constantly berate the president because he doesn't have a guarantee. He isn't offering immediate and total destruction. He does have a plan designed to, uh, designed to avoid American casualties. Instead, we get a suggestion that somehow this guaranteed 
no cost immediate total victory would be achieved if only we had a different president uh, i think it's time for congress to stop harping about whether the president has a plan he has put forth a plan now congress must exercise its constitutional role in defining what authorizations the president is going to be granted and what portions of his plan are going to be authorized uh, i look forward i hope though doubt uh, to a serious debate on the floor of this house where we will discuss and vote on and amend and vote on the amendments of a resolution dealing with whether to arm uh, Syrians and train them with a resolution as to whether to have a long-term uh, perhaps a multi-year perhaps bombing campaign against ISIS and whether the president is authorized to use ground forces finally I want to focus on the Middle East itself and how complicated the situation is and I want to praise the president not only for his decisive action but also for his wise caution because the situation we face in the Middle East is far more complicated than the president's detractors would let on the natural reaction upon seeing those horrific videos is to say ISIS is in the embodiment of all evil and its total and immediate destruction is all that we need to do should be our entire focus but let's look at the situation we look not only on the entity we want to destroy but also at who will be empowered by its destruction who is on the ground in Syria and the uh, Sunni areas of Iraq that is fighting ISIS and stands to gain if ISIS is destroyed if we make the list we see entities that are nearly as evil as ISIS and are if anything more capable of hitting our homeland hitting Europe hitting targets outside the Middle East than ISIS itself first we see that ISIS is engaged in war with the al-Nusra Front al-Nusra is what is a dedicated branch of al-Qaeda one of its more capable branches and so the destruction of ISIS will to some degree empower al-Qaeda and al-Nusra since they are both rivals in fighting for support among extremist Sunnis second on the list of ISIS foes is the Assad regime now the very people who are attacking the president for not acting precipitously today were call were attacking the president last year for not bombing the Assad regime so they attack him last year for not bombing Assad and this year for not bombing Assad's number one enemy uh, the only consistency here is you're attacking the president for not bombing somebody the fact is that uh, this Al-Sad has the blood of many tens of thousands of people uh, on his hands and his empowerment uh, his success removing the ISIS problem that he has will be one of the disadvantages of destroying ISIS third is Iran and Hezbollah Iran and Hezbollah have uh, uh, are waging war against Isis today and embody a greater long-term threat to the United States than Isis keep in mind Hezbollah killed hundreds of Marines during the Reagan administration in Lebanon Hezbollah and Iran working together have conducted operations on a variety of different continents you know there's all this talk about how there are members of people fighting with ISIS that have American passports and they might come back and conduct an operation there are those who are fighting with ISIS that have European passports that could go to Europe and conduct an operation that's might Iran and Hezbollah have been conducting operations in South America Europe Asia for decades and Iran came close to effectuating an assassination right here in Washington DC just within the last decade 
So, yes, it would be good to destroy ISIS, but let's not kid ourselves. Those who would be empowered by those des that destruction include entities nearly as evil and probably more dangerous uh, than ISIS itself. I bring up this complexity to argue against those who wonder why we didn't just lash out immediately. Why do we need caution? We need caution because the situation is not as simple as an old Western movie where you have the good guy in a white hat and the bad guy in a black hat, and if the bad guy gets killed, the good guy draw a uh, peace and unity and, and, and wonderful life is restored, and the good cowboy in the white hat rides off into the sunset with a schoolmarm. Al-Nusra is not a schoolmarm. Hezbollah is not a schoolmarm. Iran is developing nuclear weapons. The Middle East is not near as simple as the president's detractors uh, pretend. So I look forward to doing something that members of Congress don't necessarily look forward to doing, and that is taking responsibility and casting tough votes. But if we're going to be true to the Constitution, we will not allow to stay on the books in its present form a 2001 resolution adopted in the immediate aftermath of the terrible events that occurred 13 years ago today and allow that statement to be twisted and stretched and applied to situations well beyond its description. We will instead do what the Constitution requires of us, and that is to define what is the president authorized to do under these circumstances for the goals that we have this decade and at this time. At that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman have a motion. Uh, adjourn or just recess? But till when? Reluctant uh, to do that since I haven't been authorized by my leadership. Well, I voted against uh, numerous adjournment resolutions. Very, very good. I mean, I don't mind adjourning till uh, next Monday. Well, that's the way. That's that's the way for you. Oh. Well, uh, you want me to move to that we adjourn until? Um, just just move to adjourn. And So you're sure that if I move to adjourn, the House is legally obligated? Yes, sir. Okay. Having, I've been advised by the parliamentarian that if I move to adjourn, the House is legally committed to uh, uh, reconvene uh, this coming Monday, and for that reason, I move to adjourn.